I am uh, grateful that you all are here and just uh, thankful that we get to uh, go to the Word of God this morning and, and uh, learn some more about Jesus. Amen. Grateful for the salvation that He has provided for us. Grateful that He is faithful. Grateful for the things that He has done just here in our local congregation and the work that He's doing um, in the lives of people here and in our community, in Montana, and uh, grateful that God is granting us an opportunity to be a part of that in our school, in our schools, uh, just grateful for uh, all that the Lord is doing. And so <clears throat> this morning, if you have your word, we're just going to invite you uh, to join us um, in turning to Luke chapter 2, familiar passages of scripture with regards to Christmas time. But this morning, we want to focus on a particular occurrence in the life of Jesus as he was still only eight days old. We want to look at Simeon's prophecy. We want to look at what a man of God spoke under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in foretelling exactly who Jesus would be and what he would do. Now, let's start with a word of prayer, and then we'll just get in God's word. Let's pray. Lord, we just come, and we ask you to, to reveal yourself to us in these words, and help us to correctly read them, understand them, and obey them, that we might know you more deeply, that we might follow you more closely, that we might tell of you more clearly, and the world would come to know you. In Jesus' name, amen. Contrary to popular culture and opinion, the phrase that y'all heard this all the time, you do you, I'll do me, uh, meaning that whatever's good for you, you just do it, and whatever's good for me, I'll just do it. And we take that and we put it into all of our the areas of our lives, and we begin to say, well, you know, if church is good for you, do church. And if Jesus is good for you, do, do Jesus. But uh, I'm going to do me. In other words, don't bother, about, don't bother me. And, and we, when we do that, unknowingly, what we do is we put forth the idea <clears throat> that Jesus is um, what we would say the possibility for people to be indifferent about Jesus. Uh, in other words, we leave room for people to be passionate about Jesus, but no one would ever admit being dispassionate about Jesus. They would just say, I'm indifferent. That's good for you, but, but it's not good for me. But according to Simeon's prophecy that we're going to read here, and according to Jesus' own words, uh, and according to the further uh, revelation in the epistles, there is no room, as Sean says, there is no room for indifference about Jesus. Now, you and I have been in a place where we could take it or leave it, but we didn't understand at that time where we had this attitude of take him or leave him that we were really leaving him. You see, we can't be indifferent. You either make room or you don't make room. But you can't stay on the fence. To not make a decision for Christ is to make a decision against Christ. To not be for him is to be against him. There is no indifference. There is no you do him and I'll do myself. You do Jesus or you reject him totally. When you say, not now, but another day, you're not remaining indifferent. 
you are rebelling. Look at Luke chapter 2. <clears throat> Jesus has been born. The prophecy is given to Zacharias. The prophecy has been given to Mary. The prophecy has been given to Elizabeth. And now we come to Jesus being eight days old. The, the, the uh, revelation to the shepherds. They've come. They've seen. They've heard. They've left to tell. And now eight days later, it's time for them under the law to take Jesus to the temple to dedicate him. At his dedication is where he's circumcised, recognized to be in covenant with God as part of the people of Israel and the lineage of Abraham, and that's where he's given his name. That's what's, that's what's the setup for this. So let's look at verse 22. Now, when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem. Oh, I'm sorry. Verse 21, and when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. That's where he's circumcised, all right, and that's where they give him his name. Now, the days of her purification are 40 days according to the law, 80 days for female children, 40 days. That's where they come and they present him to the Lord. That's where we have, this is where we get child dedication from. Now, when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. <clears throat> and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit, meaning he's being led by the Spirit, he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and he blessed, blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring, gen uh, bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and the rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Now there was one, Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. So when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now, First thing I want to talk about this morning, just very briefly, I just want to mention this, is do not find it odd that the beginning of this story, this redemption story and the coming of, of Christ, that God chooses an older couple past childbearing age to bear the forerunner, John the Baptist, for Jesus. And that outside of Mary being the selected virgin, he goes back, the, the scripture goes back to um, Simeon here and Anna, both very advanced in age, but yet very devout. And so sometimes we have a tendency in our churches uh, that we overlook the elderly. But listen to me, you're never too old for God to speak to you. You're never too old for God to use you in a very powerful way. And it was... The younger people were learning from the older people <clears throat> what they were looking for, who they were looking for, and where they should be looking. 
And they came to an understanding of the things that were happening by the testimony of the older people. So I just want to throw that out there. Don't ever overlook. We we always say Christmas is for children. No, it started off with the old folk. Amen. Amen. All right, now, in our culture, it's normal for people who run up on either people they know or just complete strangers, when they see a parent or a group of parents with a tiny child, a newborn or something, to stop and to make comment about the child. Like, oh, he's so cute. It's a she. Oh, she's so cute. Have, have y'all ever done that? Yeah. Because, you know, it's usually the, it's pink if it's a girl and it's blue if it's a boy, but they have some kind of neutral color and you're just winging it, right? You know? So, um, so you just speak and you say, oh, he's so handsome, or she's got a head full of hair, or his, her skin is so pretty, or look at, look at the, his color, and they make all kinds of, of, of uh, things, uh, statements about beauty and skin and hair, and oh, he looks like his mama, and oh, she looks like her daddy, or vice versa. You know, I don't want to say it one way and somebody get mad. But, but let me ask you a question. If you walked up to Mary and Joseph, and you saw baby Jesus, how would you greet them? Oh, he looks like God. <laughs> or how about this one? Well, to be honest, Joseph, he looks like his mama. He doesn't have any resemblance to you. <laughs> or how about this? Man, his feet's big. He's like a duck. He, I bet he can walk on water. He's so handsome, I bet he's going to sweep all the girls in Bethlehem off their feet. Well, they didn't receive any of those kinds of compliments. They they had received uh, some guys that came out of the field, some shepherds, uh, who said, uh, we've come to see the baby. And the scripture tells us that those shepherds informed Mary and Joseph of what the angel said and what the angelic host said. And here's what they said. There is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Not like, oh, he's so cute and look at that hair. But look, the Savior of the world. The Messiah of God. Wait a minute. We're, we're looking for a military, politically connected, savvy leader who's going to bring us all together as a people, throw off the yoke of Roman bondage, and set us free as we were in the days of David. And you say, behold. Oh, yeah, but he's the son of God. So it, it was just this quandary that they have in their mind, first through the prophecies of Elizabeth, then through the the uh, angelic visitation to Zechariah, and then Mary's uh, pronunciation that she knows that God is providing for even her a Savior. And, 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 and so when people would normally be making comments like, he's so handsome, she's so cute, and look at that skin, they are getting this news, and they're gathering it in pieces from Elizabeth, from Zechariah, from an angel, from shepherds, uh, and now from Simeon about their son. And none of it has to do with him being cute or handsome or hair or skin. It has everything to do with his assignment, his purpose. He has come to save his people. And that's where we have to put the focus on. Whenever you do uh, the nativity scene, whenever you do the Christmas play, the focus should be on the baby. Yet he's the one in the entire scene that can't be seen. He's stuck down in some hay somewhere, and everybody's looking at the jack leg three wise men who didn't even come onto the scene till two, two and a half years later. So we, met, we, we, we merged everything together into one scene, and we messed the whole thing up. And so now they have this encounter with Simeon. And man, this, is, this one really puts a different angle on it. This one really puts a different angle on it. Now, Simeon is an ordinary man 
with extraordinary devotion. He loves God. He's an older man and he loves God. And he's been seeking God and he's been seeking the Messiah. Which, by the way, let me just go on and say this. Going back to old folk. If you want to follow somebody in these last days, you better find you an old folk to be following out because there ain't too many young folks heading in the right direction. And it was, it was, amen. And there was, listen, and the only two people, listen, the only two people in the whole Christmas story that was looking for Jesus was Simeon and Anna. The only two people that were looking. Zacharias was praying, but Anna and Simeon were looking. And they knew that he was going to come to the temple at some point in time. It had been prophesied that he would come into the temple, into the house, into his own house and clean it out and, 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 uh, and, and sift through the wheat and, and throw the chaff into the fire. They had heard the story. They come to the temple. And so Simeon is in the temple because he loves God, just an ordinary man with extraordinary devotion. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And the Holy Spirit is leading Simeon into the temple at the exact same time, the world would say, and it just so happened. That's what the world says. And it just so happened. No, no, God is running the outfit here. God is working this out. So when Mary and Joseph walk in with the baby, in comes Simeon. And Simeon has a promise from God. And that promise is, in return for your devotion, Simeon, in return for your searching for and longing for and seeking out the coming Messiah, God made him a promise. You will not die, you will not leave this earth until you have seen God's Messiah, Israel's Messiah. So he's just coming to the temple, and it's just another day, but he's walking by faith, and he's standing on a promise, and the Spirit of God leads him into an intersection with Mary and Joseph, and behold, the baby. And the Holy Spirit brings him there, and, 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 and we're not told, look at this verse here. And it be and it, uh, look at verse twenty six. And when it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ, so he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, look at this now. He took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, "Now here's the question: How did Simeon know that?" The baby was the Messiah. Because we're not told here. We're not told here. But it's implied. It says that the Holy Spirit was upon Simeon. And we've already seen in Elizabeth's encounter with Mary that when Mary spoke that the baby, uh, John the Baptist, in the womb, hears the voice of Mary, leaps in her womb, the Holy Spirit bears testimony, Elizabeth prophesies and says, What manner of this, that the mother of my Lord would come and visit me? For as soon as the child, talking about her child, heard the voice of you, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. So we just have to assume, and not, not just hypothetically assume, but by imp the implication of the story of the Holy Spirit being upon uh, Simeon, that the Spirit of God bore witness to Simeon that what he was looking at was the child of God because no conversation had taken place. And guys, that's how it is with people when they hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's how it is when people get around other people who were born again and said, man, there's just something different about you. I'm telling you, and the Scripture bears witness that the Holy Spirit of God not only testifies to us of the person of Jesus Christ, but He bears witness to the world. The Bible says, Jesus said, when the Spirit has come, He will take of mine and declare it to you. He will convict the world of sin of sin because they believe not upon me and convince the world of righteousness and of the coming judgment. When people hear the gospel, there is a witness of the Holy Ghost 
upon an unregenerate heart. And you don't know how you know, but you just know that you know that what I'm hearing is the truth. What I'm seeing is the light. What I know to be true is true. And I'm going to deny it. I may turn away from it. I may not receive it. But i got to be honest with myself. When you talk to me, when you pray for me, when I see you, when you witness to me, when I hear the gospel, there's something that bears witness. And it's the Spirit of God. If it was just me or just you, the world could take me or leave me, and they could take you and leave you. But it's the God in you, and it's the God on you that they can't stand. Jesus said they're going to hate you because they hated me. And it's the Spirit of God that's on you and the Spirit of God that's in you that the world pushes against because you are a light and you are salt and you bear witness that there's somebody on the inside or there's somebody on the outside, but somebody is walking with you. And Simeon comes to understand this is the baby, and he just picks him up. Look, he says, and he took him up in his arms and said, oh, he's cute. No, here's what he did. And he blessed God. Look at what he said. And he blessed God. He said, Lord, now, see, Simeon gets it. He said, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. My eyes have seen your salvation. The Greek word there is soterion, and it means every single thing that every it means every single word that is descriptive of our salvation, spirit, soul, and body. Soterion means redemption, forgiveness, safety, rescue, deliverance, restoration. Every single word that describes our salvation and that Jesus Christ accomplished in his life, in his death, and in his resurrection is described in this word. So when Simeon picks him up, he's saying, God, thank you so much. You're fulfilling your promise to me. I'm holding in my hand. I am looking at with my eyes the sum total of all your redeeming power and grace in the person of this child. This child is going to save his people from their sin, rescue them, heal them, make them safe, bring them peace, deliver them, comfort them, counsel them. He's going to be their light in their life, their hope and their joy. He's everything. He's all in all. There's nothing you can add to him. There's nothing you can take from him. I hold in my hand your complete salvation. Hallelujah. What do you think about that? And Mary and Joseph sitting over there like. They're like. You know that babe wrapped in swaddling clothes thing. Well, that wasn't too bad. But, and Simeon done, Simeon done dropped, the, dropped, it, dropped it on as heavy. Oh, but it's, it's going to get heavier. Look at what he says. Which you have prepared. For the face of all people. They're looking for a Jewish Messiah. Oh, he's a Jew, all right. But he's not just the Savior of the Jews. He's the Savior of the Gentiles, which, by the way, you are. You're either a Jew or you're a Gentile. What it's saying is, is he's come not just to rescue the Jewish people. He's come to rescue the world. And it says that, look at what it says. It says, you have prepared before the face of all people. You prepared, you've done this in the open. This is not some secret thing. You haven't done this under the cloak of night. You have openly told of and now performed the advent, the coming of your Messiah and the person of Jesus Christ. And you've done this openly. This is not some like esoteric knowledge where a few people get it and then if you're going to get it, I get to tell you so everybody really worships me instead of worshiping God. This is like out in the open. This is for everybody. The question is, is why did an angel have to tell the shepherds? Why did the shepherds have to go tell everyone else? And why were there only two people, Simeon and, and, and Anna, in the temple that were seeking God? 
Matter of fact, when the wise men came some two and a half years later, Jesus has been residing in Bethlehem. He hadn't made his way home yet. His parents haven't taken him home. When the wise men come in and, and confront Herod, they said, we, we, have, we have come to worship the king of the Jews. We have seen his star in the east. Herod goes, king of the Jews? Snap, that's me. Or it's supposed to be me. And so it says that Herod said, time out, y'all wait right here. Tea, coffee, whatever you want. Let me meet my boys. He takes his boys over there and goes, where is this Messiah supposed to come? Here's what they said. To Bethlehem. He's supposed to be in Bethlehem. And they're going, to me, I would say, like, well, y'all weren't going to tell me this? Uh, there's going to be, if, when, when, when the new king arises, he's coming out of Bethlehem, and we don't have any people down there watching for it. We don't have any spies. We don't have anybody listening out. We, we, you, you're telling me that there's, there's a king that's been born in Bethlehem, and he's been down there some two and a half years, and we hadn't heard about it? And the question is this. Why hasn't anybody, why hasn't everybody heard about Jesus? Why isn't everybody, or why isn't there anybody that's looking for him? Let's be honest. When we woke up this morning, we weren't looking for Jesus. And we have the Scriptures. And we have the Holy Ghost. And we have the promise that he's coming again. And we still ain't looking. So we laugh and say, Herod's stupid. Well, Herod was lost. We're saved. So who's more stupid? We want to sing more about a baby that came instead of a king that's coming. And so, so, so he picks him up. And look at what it says. A light to bring revelation. That is the revelation of God to the Gentile people because the Jews had been given the revelation through the Mosaic law, and he's going to be the glory of Israel, meaning that the sum total of all that God set out to do in, through Israel by bringing his son through Abraham's line, God is going to glorify by fulfilling that in and through the Jewish people. And so it said, Joseph and his mother, they just sat back and they went, oh. And so look at verse 34. It says, then Simeon blessed them. Simeon blessed them. That's plural. Who's them? Joseph. Mary and Joseph, Mary and Jesus. It says, and, and then he said to Mary, his mother. Now, why doesn't he say to them? If Joseph is there and he is the assumed earthly father of Jesus, why isn't Simeon talking to Joseph too? Because Joseph, history tells us, the Bible implies it, J Joseph fades from the scene shortly, right after he's, he's seen one more time when Jesus comes to the temple at age 12. Joseph dies after fathering, coming to know Mary physically, fathering more children. We're told what those siblings' names are. I think there was at least five or six more brothers and sisters that Mary had with Joseph. But Joseph dies before Jesus enters into public ministry. So when, when Simeon is prophesying about what Christ will accomplish. He's speaking only to Mary because what he has to say will only affect Mary. Joseph will not be there. And so, man, the Bible's detailed, isn't it? And so he, he tells Mary, he says, Behold, this child is destined, meaning he has a set future for the fall of and the rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which will be spoken against. And yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. So you know what he said? He said, thank you, Lord, for letting me see your great soterion, your great salvation. And, and then he hands the child probably back to Mary, and he says, Mary, I need you to know something. Your son is going to be a great divider of people. 
Many people are going to rise because of him. And many people are going to fall. What he's meaning, what he's meaning there in that, in that language is, he says, many are going to come to faith. And many are going to walk away. He's not the great uniter. He's the great divider. Now, that doesn't seem like a big thing when I say it now, but it is huge because in most of our churches and certainly in the Christian world, so to speak, Jesus is being promoted as the one who brings all the world together and unites us in peace and, 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 and makes everything right. Jesus the way he's preached from the pulpits and the way that he is uh, perpetrated in the videos and in the movies and in the magazines and in the, the uh, cartoons is that he's the, he's the fairy tale ending to a screwed up world. And, and, and all of us are children of God because God made us. And therefore, we're all brothers and sisters. And we're all God's children. And so we need to believe in God who's going to bring us all together. Listen, Jesus didn't come to bring unity and peace to the world. He came to bring unity and peace to those who receive him. He is diametrically opposed to all that is in this world. He's not an all-skate Jesus. Y'all ever been skating at the skating rink? They had girls on the floor, you know, and they come out boys on the floor, and then they say what? All-skate, and that means what? That means everybody. He, he's not an all-skate Jesus. He's not an everybody-gets-a-trophy Jesus. Because we live in a world where everybody gets to go home with a trophy, whether you contribute to it or not whether you came to practice or not, whether you even participated or not. Lord, we can't damage their little psyches. We've got to give them something. Well, why don't we just give them the trophy when they get their jersey so they know they've won, and then they won't even have to come? Why don't we keep score? Why don't we keep in score? I already got my trophy. We win. I won. And, and, and it's so that we don't bruise egos. And that's why the gospel's being watered down. And that's why nobody wants to preach the truth about what Je We don't even want to preach what Jesus said because we're going to bruise egos and that empty seats and they take money and that leaves us broke, busted, and disgusted with four or five people in this 15 million monolithic castle that we've created for ourselves to praise God in. And Jesus is on the outside of the door knocking and said, If any man will open, I will come into him and sup with him. Isaiah said something a little bit different in his prophecy about the coming Jesus. In Isaiah 57, verse 15, and then skipping down to verse 21, he says, For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and the holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. Jesus didn't come to bring peace to wicked people who choose to remain wicked and, and, and reject Jesus. He came to bring peace to those who humble themselves, confess their sin, repent of it, and embrace the peace bringer. That's the people who have the peace. Jesus said in Luke eleven twenty three, 23, He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. That doesn't sound like an all-skate, Jesus does it? That doesn't sound like, does that sound like the Jesus that we're worshiping at Christmas time? No. Look at, look at uh, Luke 16, 13. No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now that last sentence is in regard to his teaching about money. But the other sentences stand alone. You cannot serve 
two masters. You cannot be in control of your own life. You cannot be the Lord of your own life. You cannot be unrepentant and forever rationalizing and embellishing and enjoying your sin while at the same time saying, Jesus Christ is Lord. He does not allow us to straddle the fence. We are with Him or we are against Him. We are not indifferent. He does not allow that. In other words, spiritually speaking, you are either on one side of salvation with Jesus Christ or you are on the other side of salvation with Jesus Christ. You are either on one side of judgment with Jesus Christ or you are on the other side of judgment with Jesus Christ. But no man abideth in the middle. In John 12, 44 through 50, then Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command that what I should say, that what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. He says, you can reject me, but to reject me is to reject the Father. To reject me is to reject my word. And I do not judge you for that, but the word that I speak to you now will meet you at the end of your life. And it will stand and it will be your judge in eternity. The words that I'm speaking to you, and you can count on that because I'm only saying the words that my father told me to say. And the words that my father told me to say are eternal life. So if you reject my word, you reject his life. If you reject me, you reject his light. You cannot receive me and remain in darkness. I will deliver you, I will break the power of darkness, and I will convey you, I will translate you, I will deposit you into the kingdom of light. Will you be perfect? No, but you will not walk in the darkness. You will not abide in the darkness. Matthew 10, 32 through 39. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I also will confess before my Father who is in heaven. Let me stop right there. There are no secret saints. There are no people who hide Jesus in their heart, but then deny him publicly everywhere and to anyone that they come in contact with. You cannot. Jesus calls you to the light. He calls us to the light. You must go public with your faith because your Savior went public with his. Your Savior died on a public cross. Your Savior confessed that he was the Son of God in a public arena. There are no secret disciples. You are either for him or you're against him. You either confess him or you deny him. Do not think, oh, I love this, because y'all think I'm crazy. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. Would you... And Shannon, Shannon's not there. Do not come. Open your Bible. I ain't reading to you. Open it up. I want you to see this. Matthew 10, 32. Yeah, that verse is 34. Matthew 10, 34. When you have it, say, I have it. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. Let me stop. He didn't come to unite all people together. He didn't come to bring peace on earth. He didn't come to be a way. He, he didn't come for your best life now. That verse right there ought to make you sell your book or use it for a door, a door stop. If you got your best life now, don't give it away. Burn it. 
or prop open your shooting house door with it. Amen? Or use it to start a fire. Because he said, I didn't come to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. How so? How, why, why did he come to do that? Because one is going to love him and one is not going to love him. Look, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Now, that's not everybody gets a trophy, Jesus. That's not all skate, Jesus. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life, that means being on his own, calling his own shots, being the shot caller, he's going to lose it. But the one who loses his life for my sake will find it. Simeon is telling Mary, Mary, you have no idea. The sorrow and the heartache and the pain that's going to be experienced by the people who do not receive Jesus. Oh, yes, we talk about the hope and the joy and the peace of all those who receive Jesus. And certainly that is so. But you need to also know this. Only those people who receive Christ by faith are the ones who are going to experience that. There is no peace for the wicked. There is no hope for the wicked outside of Christ. There is no joy for the unbeliever outside of Christ. Think about this question, and we've all been there. When we were lost and without Christ, what did you have your hope in? Let me tell you what. The next job, the next dollar, the next drink, the next cigarette, the next chick, the next guy, the next condo, the next car, the next dog, the next buck, the next gun, but it wasn't Jesus. And therefore, we had no hope. It was an illusion. Because if you're fortunate enough to get to the end of your life, and you had all the trucks, and you got all the guns, and you had all the chicks, and you drank all the beer, and you smoked all the dope, and you shot all the heroin, and you finally get to your life and you're still alive, please tell me as you're getting ready to expire, to exhale the last breath in your body, and to step out of time into eternity, tell me where is your hope? There's none. And if there's no hope for us in death, then we realize at that point that the hope that we thought we had in life was an illusion. Or as my former Church of God pastor said, if it ain't good enough to die by, it ain't good enough to live by. If it doesn't comfort you at the place of death, it cannot comfort you in the place of life. It's an illusion. It's a deception that the next it or that or experience or whatever it is is where it's all at. Only to find out that after you had the third t-shirt, it still isn't it. Because if it was, you wouldn't still be looking. Jesus leaves no room for us to be religious. Jesus leaves no room for contemporary culture's accommodation of him. He will not be tolerated as the man upstairs. He will not be tolerated and accommodated as just a righteous man, a good teacher, a social warrior, a benevolent man. No, he must be received. He must be confessed. He must be embraced as God in the flesh. God's soterion. God's salvation, the way, the truth, the life. He must be embraced in his virgin birth, in his sinless life, in his vicarious atoning death for sin on the cross, in his bodily resurrection, in his ascension, in his soon return. Anything less than that 
And you have another Jesus, another gospel, which Paul said is no gospel at all. He is not just a benign power that wound up creation and set it out there and then walked off. He is the sustaining God, as we talked about Wednesday night. Not only did God say, but those words still hold all things in their place, both seen and unseen. His very word, the W, big W, capital W word, created all things. And all things were created by him and for him and unto him. And without him was nothing made that was made. And he upholds all things by the word of his power. He literally keeps it all together. He keeps the laws of physics in place so that we don't float off into the sunset. So that our world stays at a 22 and a half or 23 and a half tilt on its axis with a moon going around us controlling the tides that controls the winds, that controls the temps, that controls the weather. He keeps us in perfect orbit around the sun. He keeps everything in its place. He knows the name of every star. He knows the very numbers of the hairs on your head. He had a name for you before you were ever formed in your mother's womb. He has a plan for you, and that plan is in his son, Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe upon him would not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might might be saved and those who believe have life and those who believeth not are condemned already and this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light and we're not willing to come to the light lest their evil deeds be exposed this is the condemnation you either embrace him or you reject him you receive him or you walk away from him but he will not let you leave here straddling the fence you will be for him or you will be against him. You will either gather with him or you will scatter against him. You are either forgiven or you are condemned. You are heaven bound or hell bound. You are saved or you are lost. You're a child of the king or you're a child of the devil. But he will not let you stay in the middle. First century believers, to include the apostles, were not persecuted and martyred for proclaiming a foot washed in Jesus. In Acts 2, 36 and 38, Peter, being filled with the Holy Ghost, stands before the thronging crowds gathered for the Feast of Pentecost. And he says, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Oh, you do you, and I'll do me. No. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 4, 8 through 12. Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit and said to them, Rulers of the people of Israel, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you. Look at what he said. He said, let it be known to you. And all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. By him, this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone, nor is there salvation in any other way, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. You cannot add to him. You cannot take away from him. He is God's 
soterion. He is God's salvation, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He who was and who is and who is to come forevermore. How are we having churches and meetings in which people come and hear the gospel and make no decision for Christ? That's the question that we always ask. How is it that people are listening to the gospel and they're not making a decision? Well, first of all, when you ask the wrong question, you get the wrong answer. Everyone is making a decision. You're going to leave here today and you will have made a decision. I'm going to follow Christ. You're going to stand up as a dad or as a brother or as a newly uh, wedded husband and you're going to say, as for me in my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Who do you say that Jesus is? He is the Christ, the Son of the living God the Savior, the Satyrion of the world. Or you're going to make a decision that regardless of what you've heard and regardless of the testimony and the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, you are going to walk away and in doing so, you will pridefully rebel against the one who humbled himself to bring you everlasting life. And when you walk away from the light, All you have is darkness. And when you walk away from life, all you have is death. And when you walk away from forgiveness, all you have left is condemnation. Today, you will make a decision. And you will leave through those doors or that door or that door. And you will either be comforted. In the fact that you know Jesus Christ as Lord. Or you will be convicted and tormented with the understanding that he knows you as an unrepentant sinner. You're going to leave comforted. Or you're going to leave convicted. You're going to leave with hope. Or you're going to leave hopeless. You're going to be leave here saved. Or you're going to leave here lost. But you will not stay indifferent.